One of the reasons that games like Minecraft, Factorio, and Terraria are so much fun, just so much fun, is because of the limitless worlds they give you to explore. Because each playthrough is different, each world will present unique challenges to the player and teach you something along the way. Thus, getting better at the game doesn't look like rote memorization of where level elements are, but instead understanding the systems that underpin the game and learning how to use those systems to your advantage. It is you, the player, that levels up, not just your character. On the one hand, this means that game studios don't need to pay someone to place every single level element in some kind of a game, but they do need to come up with systems and assets that will make a believable enough world that people will want to play in it. While there are many elements that game designers still need to create in order for these worlds to exist, textures, items, systems, actors, sound effects, music, etc., there is one principle that sits at the very center of this, procedural generation. This means that instead of having a human build up the world as a series of deliberate design choices, the world is instead created by an automated procedure, an algorithm, whose rules are tuned by the designer to give the world a look and feel that they want it to have. This means that the distribution of resources, dirt, iron, copper, coal, etc., is dictated by that algorithm and whatever the knobs are tuned to. In fact, some games like Factorio give you the ability to tune those knobs yourself so that you can create the experience you want. In this video, I want to describe in mathematical detail one of the first algorithms to do this very thing, Perlin noise. To understand Perlin noise, we need to first back up a step and try to understand what noise is. Noise is essentially a manifestation of randomness. When recording something with a microphone or taking a picture with a camera, this randomness is something we generally want to get rid of. In the making of this video, I used tools to remove some of the signal noise from my audio recording. When taking pictures, that noise manifests as the grainy jitter in the image. There's an art to this. Anyway, that's where the name comes from. But we're not trying to get noise out of a signal, we're trying to generate noise from scratch, replacing human decisions with random decisions that still add up to a believable world. We'll start with the idea of a height map, which is essentially a map that's made out of pixels. For every pixel, we'll assign a value from 0 to 1, 0 being black and 1 being white, or if seen from the side, 0 will be the lowest height possible and 1 will be the highest height possible. If we just assign a random value to every pixel, we get this. It's not very usable for what we want. This is essentially white noise. If this were a terraria map, it would look like this, which is crazy. We need our noise to be a lot smoother than whatever this is. There are different strategies to try to smooth this out, and it creates different categories of noise. The one we're exploring is a type of gradient noise, the first of its kind, called Perlin noise, named after Ken Perlin who invented it. The end result will look like this. We can control several things, including how much detail we want in the final result, to try to get the world we want. To best understand this explanation, you should be somewhat familiar with vectors and the idea of a dot product. I'll be covering these things, but it probably won't serve as a great first introduction. So how does it work? What we're hoping to do is to take a random sequence of digits and turn it into smoothly connected light and dark patches. The best way to understand how this works is to break it up into steps. First, you get a stream of random numbers. Next, you break your map up into cells using a grid. Then, at every corner of the grid, you put an influence vector and rotate it according to whatever your random number generator tells you to. Then, for each pixel and each cell, you figure out what the dot product is between the influence vector and the offset vector, which is a vector that points from the pixel to the corner. Putting all of the pixels together gives you a map. Since each pixel is influenced by four vectors, you'll have four maps when you're done. Here, for every pixel, we're taking four dot products, pairing each offset vector with the influence vector that it points to. Then we'll blend those four maps together using a smoothing function. This is one octave of Perlin noise. To add more detail, we'll go one octave up. It's the same thing as going up an octave in a Western scale. You have the length, in this case, the side of a cell. 
Once you've gotten all the octaves you want to apply, you then simply blend them together. Technically, the end result here falls under the category of fractal noise, but it's pretty common to just call this Perlin noise too. Let's go into some detail. First, how do we turn a handful of digits, a seed value, into an infinite string of digits? Well, you'll need something called a pseudo-random number generator, one that operates on a seed value. It's called pseudo-random because it's not really random, there's an algorithm that produces it which kind of bars it from being truly random. But that being said, for the purposes of world generation, it's usually plenty random enough. The way it works is you plant the seed and it will give you a never-ending sequence of digits. Repeatability is important though, particularly if you want to give the player the ability to go back to a known world or share worlds among friends or even with a whole community. Depending on if it's a good speedrunning seed or if it's just really good for gameplay reasons, it opens up a lot of options. While fascinating, it's a bit beyond the scope of this video to really go into the details of how pseudo-random number generators work, particularly because there are so many options. Now that we have a stream of digits, let's put them to good use. We'll divide our map up with a grid, and each cell of this grid will be referred to as a chunk, because, well, it's a chunk of the world. Next, we'll assign an influence vector to each corner of this grid. Using those random digits, we'll assign a rotation to each vector. Exactly how you do this is up to you, and will depend on what pseudo-random number generator you use. One approach is to take regular snippets of this stream, and we'll call those snippets words. Then we'll just assign each word to a vector. If each word is between 1 and 8, then you have 8 rotations to pick from. If it's between 1 and 32, you have 32 rotations. To ensure that you always get a unique world for a given seed, you should make sure to assign the words to the vectors in a consistent order. A good option here is a spiral, because that way, the player can go in pretty much any direction they want to explore, and the game will serve them up fresh chunks of world. Here, you can see that Vectorio does something with a spiral. I don't know, some kind of special spiral. Next, we break up each chunk into pixels, which will become tiles in the game. For example, here's what the chunks look like in Factorio, and you can see that they're broken up into tiles. This is what it looks like in Terraria, which is not an infinite world, but I'm still convinced they use Perl and Noise or some other gradient function to generate some of the terrain. The specific needs of your game is going to determine what resolution you need. We need to consider the four offset vectors associated with each pixel. Essentially, each offset vector is just the vector that starts at the pixel and ends at one of the four corners. This is where the dot product comes in. The dot product multiplies two vectors, giving you a value, basically a real number. This value is called a scalar, which is why you might also hear this referred to as a scalar product. I mentioned earlier that each pixel is influenced by these four vectors. The way that influence manifests is by taking this dot product. Let's focus on taking the dot product for the upper left influence vector. The two vectors we're using for this dot product are the influence vector, of course, and the offset vector that points from the pixel to the influence vector. The nitty gritty of how you calculate this will probably differ from the way I'm doing it, but nonetheless, here's how I did it for an example. My offset vectors are given in coordinates, A and B, and have a length that changes from pixel to pixel. My influence vectors are unit vectors that have been rotated, so their coordinates are given by cosine theta and sine theta. So the dot product between them is just a cosine theta plus b sine theta. If you need to brush up on your dot products, check out the link I've left in the description. The result of this dot product is a scalar value. And when we want to visualize the maps, we'll assign this value to the brightness of the pixel. The lowest value will be black, and the highest value will be white. Here's what we get if we do this for all the pixels in our current grid. There is definitely a nice, smooth transition, and in art, that's what we call a gradient. You see them all the time in various pieces of software. Here, the fact that calculating the dot product across this area gives such a smooth gradient is why Perlin noise is called a gradient noise function in the first place. But we see an issue if we zoom out. Each chunk has a sharp jump along its borders. We want to smooth that out somehow. That's where the other three maps come in, the upper right, lower left and lower right influence maps. We're going to blend pairs of maps together in a particular sequence. We'll blend the maps together horizontally and then vertically. But how do we blend a pair of maps? Well, we need two techniques, lerping and smooth stepping. Lerp is shorthand for linear interpolation. 
In this context, what we want is to smoothly transition between two maps, one row of pixels at a time. To see what lines I'm talking about, let's look at a moving horizontal cross-section of the upper left map. Each cell has a line that moves smoothly within its boundaries. Looking at the upper right map simultaneously shows us the other line we want to look at. What we want is to lerp between the two lines in each cell. That is, we're going to start at the left side of one line and end up on the right side of the other. We could just draw a line between them, but we want a smooth transition, a curve built out of interpolated points. Lerping accomplishes this by slicing up each line into some number of segments. Normally, it'd be whatever your pixel count is, but for the sake of convenience, let's just say eight. We put down our start and end points, and then the interpolated points. The first point goes one eighth of the way down the first line segment. The second is two eighths down the second segment. The third is three eighths the way down the third, and so on. The curve you get will smoothly move from one end to the other. Let's see what this looks like in the moving cross section, but this time with the continuous lerped surface between them. The blended result moves nicely between the two lines in each cell. But there is still a problem. There are sharp corners where two lerped curves meet. Seen from above, it looks like this. In calculus, the sharp areas are called kinks, and we want to smooth between them. Essentially, we're going to ease from one end of the cell to the other following this curve here. This is what it looks like when we do it. This is much smoother. The mapping function is given here. The way we use it is as the x value goes from left to right, we feed those values into the function and then feed those into the lerp function. I've left a link in the description below with details on how to implement this yourself from a programming perspective. Seen from above, you can see we've horizontally smoothed out the boundaries between cells. After blending the lower left and lower right maps together, we'll then blend those results together to smooth out the vertical boundaries. And voila, the first octave of Perlin noise. We can add detail by blending this with progressively finer octaves. First, pick how many you want. They're easy enough to make, it's just the same Perlin noise, but with a smaller grid. How much smaller it is, is determined by a multiplier called lacunarity. If your lacunarity is two, then each grid is twice as dense as the one before it. Lastly, we want the influence of each successive octave to diminish. Otherwise, the last, densest octave you include will basically overwhelm all the earlier ones, which looks like white noise again. The reduction in influence is accomplished with another multiplier called persistence. If your persistence is 0.5, then each successive octave will be half as influential as the one before. Blending octaves together is actually really straightforward. We simply add the pixel values together. The one gotcha here is that you want to be aware of what your range is when you finish, no matter how many octaves you included. That is, you should pin a number to what the lowest and highest values are. Generally, you can do this by figuring out the highest and lowest value for the dot product of each octave. But often, this is something you end up tuning by hand at the very end of the process. And when you're done, you have this. You could use this to make a landscape by assigning colors to various bands in the noise function. Or you could use this to place resources on a 2D map by cutting off everything under a certain value and keeping only the parts above. Perlin noise can even be extended into three dimensions, and not by merely transforming a 2D image into a height map, but rather by generating native 3D noise. Instead of having a square with four influence vectors, you have a cube with eight influence vectors because it has eight corners. In principle, there's no limit here. You could go to four dimensions or five or whatever you like, if you can find a use for such a thing. Perlin noise is incredibly flexible. It can be used to create worlds or procedural textures to add scuff marks to materials, make organic generated props like rocks, or whatever you can imagine really. Coming back to where we started, I need to admit that I'm not exactly sure what algorithms and what modifications made to them the games mentioned in this video use. There's many to choose from, and even after one is selected, the result will have to be modified some way in order to make a world believable. But I hope this video has given you some insight into the inner workings of these processes and that it can help you make and use those tools to make your dreams a reality. Thanks for watching and congratulations on reaching the next term in your own Taylor expansion. I'm Derek Taylor and I'll see you next time.
Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe. If you really like the video, come on over to our Patreon page where you can get involved and see all the cool stuff we're doing.